Next story, the one municipal chief executive, Isahaku Tahiru Mumen, has warned owners of buildings on waterways that the assembly would soon embark on a demolition exercise to bring them down. He said the owners of such properties had defied the assembly's building plan and cites them at a place of their choice. Well, he warned they are not going to countenance the selfish interests of any individual or groups of individuals to the detriment of the municipality. Mr. Isahaku Tahiru Mumen gave the warning at uh, the municipality's town hall meeting held in Wa. We bring a report by Rafik Salam. The purpose of the town hall meeting organized by the Ministry of Information in collaboration with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development is to give members and leaders of communities opportunity to discuss the projects and programs rolled out by the government. It is also a way of obtaining feedback from the citizenry to enhance the implementation of strategies and processes for the accelerated development of the Wild municipality in particular and the country at large. The meeting brought together people from all walks of life, notable among them being community leaders, leaders of political parties, women and some marginalized groups. Deputy Upper West Regional Minister Amidu Chinia Isaku enumerated the various flagship programs of the government, starting from the Plantum for Food and Jobs to free senior high school programs. The one municipal municipality received a total number of MPK 44,931 bucks and a total number of sulfates 13,288 bucks as at uh, 27 July. Uh, 2017. So this is what government has been doing under planting for food and jobs and I am sure all of you are aware that this year 2017 farmers are very excited because the cost of fertilizer has been reduced and they've been able to buy fertilizer to apply on their farms and we expect that their incomes will increase and their lives will change. While Municipal Chief Executive Isaku Tahir Mumen took time to roll out to participants the development strategy of the assembly and the benefit the people will get from its implementation. Some issues that were of concern to residents of the one municipality and which were raised at the forum had to do with youth employment, security, challenges in the management of the disability fund, building of structures on waterways, and the decongestion of the central business district of the municipality. Mr. Isaac Otaru stated that plans are far afoot to give roads in the municipality a facelift. He, however, warned that the assembly will soon embark on an exercise to demolish illegal structures in the municipality. If you build on a roadway, you are blocking access to the whole area. In terms of uh, fire or even emergency, you know, people's life will be a danger. So we will not allow you, an individual, to sit on the entrance of the larger people. So we are going to the full. So when we go, we are taking the data. So we, are doing, we have already done the scanning around. We know the areas where those buildings are. So we are taking the data when we finish, we go to the field. And when we get to the field, in fact, there is no mercy. We're going to bring every building that is on the waterway on the road. You know, we're going to bring it down. We're going to make sure that the municipality, you know, leaves to its name. You know, this is a municipality. And then whatever that is happening here should, should you know, represent the municipality. You know, so we don't have to allow the place to look like as it was before. We have to bring change to it. On the issue of security, he noted that several police personnel have been transferred out of the municipality without being replaced which has crippled police patrols in the municipality. There are a lot of transfers, you know, from the police service, from the municipality. Uh, a number of people have been transferred out, and they used to have a number of uh, patrol teams, and nine of these patrol teams have been collapsed as a result of transfers of the region. And that has translated into some of the crime and then the insecurity that we are experiencing within the municipality. And, and we are appealing, seriously, we are appealing to the, the sector minister and then the IGP to seriously take this concern, at least send down more troops to us, at least to forestall the challenges that we have here in terms of uh, uh, public uh, security. Reporting for Dwayne News, Rafik Salam. Wa the presence of holes and patches on plant leaves most likely depicts the plant is either infested with diseases or any other infestation. Well, farmers, out of panic, are compelled to look for pesticides to get rid of the transmission agents. There are, however, questions about whether it is the case all the time. 
Lava firms Kusidebra explores holes and patches on crops farmers should be worried about or otherwise. Scientifically known as Hibiscus subderifera, this plant is locally known as Beto. It's linked to its lava fair with granite soup. Many have, however, discovered characteristic holes on the leaves. They are caused by one main carpet, the flea beetle. It is named so because of the ability to jump like fleas when it is disturbed. Flea beetles can be a headache to many farmers as they attack major agricultural crops. At the Crops Research Institute, one of the potato varieties, Apomodin, is almost ready for harvest. Like the beetle, however, it is riddled with holes. A process known as tuber balking involves transportation of sugars from the leaves to the tubers and turn into starch. The reverse can occur if plants are under stress, resulting in lower yield and poorer market quality. Vine growth will consume nutrients at the expense of tuber growth. Dr. Ernest Berfi is a cocoa yam and potato breeder. So the root formation, storage root formation starts as from two months going. And during that time, the emphasis of channeling or transferring the starch that is produced in the leaves goes more into the formation of the roots than in the leaves. And for that matter, the plant has a mechanism to manage this transfer of photosynthesis or the starch from the leaves to the roots. During those times, the mature leaves of sweet potato that are found to be uh, under the leaves or larger are not active in producing starch or photosynthesis. And so they also tend to depend on the photosynthesis or the starch that are being produced by the active young leaves. And so for the plant to make sure that it's feeding less people in this case, and it tends to cause the older brother leaves to die, we say it in science senescence. He, however, has this caution for farmers. If you're a sweet potato producer and you see that, and you think that you are not so much sure of what is happening, you could also get to your nearest agri extension officer or let your scientists know the experts will come and then they will carve your nerves for you to have a successful sweet potato production. Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. Away from agriculture, the University of Cape Coast says it will soon hit its target of a complete paperless system to give comfort and relief to students, especially first-year freshmen. Uh, fresh students in times past have had to queue for longer periods before being served, but the situation seemed to have been resolved this time as parents and students went through the process at the university with ease. Richard Kujunia Kung was at the university and reports that the University of Cape Coast authorities were determined to make life less cumbersome for students. With the new system the university is operating, fresh students are required to do everything on the internet with minimal physical contact, a complete departure where a student had to queue in the sun for hours, and other frustrating moments such students and their parents had to endure. Eugene Date is the Vice Dean of Student Affairs at UCC. Once they finish selecting their rooms, what they do is that they print out, um, they get a printout and also print what we call a license agreement and download copies of their medical forms. With these, when they get to campus, they, suppose, they go to their various halls, present these printouts to the various halls, and then they are pointed to their rooms. Basically, that's what we put in place this semester, and that's why we're not seeing a lot of the queues and the commotions that which were there the last academic year. With time, we want to get to a point where there will be no paper. So, for instance, you come to campus with a shot of whatever documents um, that you got after selecting your room. Show that document to the hall assistant, and they will just point you to your room. The practice left students with very painful memories about the university, but with the paperless system in progress, alumni of the university feel it is the best way to go and would improve on the university's alumni relations and also improve the university's image. 
Dr. Mike Boachi Yadom is an alumnus of the university and a research fellow at the University of Cape Coast. As, as a former student of the hall, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I mean, looking back many years ago when I came as a fresher um, and, and looking at the long queues at uh, those times and the seemingly absent of queues today, I am, I am very excited. I believe we've gone a long way um, as, as a hall, as, as an institution. And uh, the fact that many of the um, um, processes are online, I believe, um, have, have, have created this calm atmosphere that we are witnessing here. Um, the alumni who are with me are excited, the students are excited, the whole executive are excited. I believe that the, the move-in weekend um, activities will go a long way to determine whether one wants to associate with the University Alumni Association or not. Senior Hall Tutor of Alcohol, Ernest Amankwe Frifa, is extremely excited that the system has brought relief to the university administrators. As an environmental scientist, uh, pushing too much paper is a waste of resources. Yeah, so to me, as a professional, it is a breakthrough. And I think it is also going to, you know, uh, let the students, first of all, know who is coming into a room with me start the linkage from the house before we get in. So it is going to build that kind of association among the students. And then the general atmosphere in the hall is also going to improve because it is going to minimize as much as possible the student-to-student -student confrontations that you know, we have in the rooms. Richard Kwejo Joy News, Cape Coast. The Wa Secute Court has sentenced 33 year old driver Adam Ibrahim to 25 years imprisonment in hard labor. He was accused of attacking and inflicting deep cutlass wounds on the student of the University for Development Studies. Mr. Ibrahim was also charged with attempted robbery and causing unlawful harm. Checks revealed the accused was a beneficiary of the Justice for All program and was just acquitted on May 1, 2017. Here's a report by Rafik Salam. Prosecuting Detective Chief Inspector Daniel Yebua told the court that the complainant and the victim, who are both students of the work campus of the University for Development Studies, were staying at their hostel room when the accused, 33 year old driver Adam Ibrahim, wearing a face mask and armed with a sub cutlass, forcibly broke into their room with his accomplice, who is currently at large. Ibrahim Adam attacked the victim, Harry Amankwa and inflicted on him deep cutlass wounds on his right shoulder, head, right wrist, whilst his accomplice positioned himself at the entrance of the room with a gun. Chief Inspector Yebo stated that Harry Amankwa fell in a pool of blood and started struggling. The accused then pounced on the complainant who had sought refuge under a scroll in his bed and attempted to butcher him. But the complainant mustered courage and managed to entangle him what is covered cloth. In the process, the complainant succeeded in disarming the accused of the cutlass and inflicted a deep cut on the elbow of the accused. The accused, together with his accomplice, then sensed danger and bolted away. The victim, with his right arm almost severed off, was rushed to the War Regional Hospital and a report later made to the War Police. The prosecution added that later in the same night, the accused also visited the War Regional Hospital to seek treatment for his cut on the elbow, and the victim identified him, and he was arrested by the police. The accused was quickly taken to his house at Walsombo, where a face mask stained with blood was retrieved on his compound. Also retrieved were a pair of sneakers, goosey branded pullover, black jeans, all stained with blood. The prosecution charged the accused for attempted robbery and causing unlawful harm. He pleaded not guilty to the two charges and went for a full trial. During the trial, the prosecution called two witnesses and the accused also brought one defense witness. The was sacred court judge, Justice Fawson Bear in his evaluation of the case, found the accused guilty of both charges and sentenced him to 25 years imprisonment in hard labor. This is the third time the accused has been handed a prison sentence in his three year life. He was first sentenced 18 months in 2012 by the World District Court for stealing. He had his second date with the prison on the 11th of September 2014 when he was sentenced to four years imprisonment. 
He was later released by the Justice for All program on 1st May 2017. Reporting for Jay News, Rafik Salam. Wa. I will have to apologize for the horrid pictures in that story. The high cost of houses could see a fall as government looks to re-establish the Bank for Housing and Construction. The re-establishment of the Bank for Housing and Construction would also help tackle the housing deficit in the country by creating an avenue to address the challenges of financing within the housing and construction sector. Speaking to Joy Business, the Deputy Minister for Works and Housing, Frida Prempe, said the ultimate goal is to drive down the cost of houses in Ghana. We are working hard to revise and review and bring back to life the Bank for Housing and Construction for Ghana so that investors can seek um, folk for credit facilities at a very reduced rate. You know that if you have a credit facility with so much interest, the ripple effect is on the final consumer. Consumer, So if you're able to cut down on costs, if you're able to cut down on interest rates, if you're able to help the investor assess credit facilities, it will help the building industry to grow. And the final consumer wouldn't have to pay so much for a two-bedroom apartment or a one-bedroom apartment. We are looking Looking forward to see a real quality, affordable housing unit where the average Ghanaian can purchase. You want it, like I said earlier on, when you drive around, you see a lot of houses, a lot of apartments, a lot of units crying for buyers. So the question one asks is, why are we talking about housing deficit when all these houses are looking for buyers? And the, the, the answer is simple. People can't afford it because some investors have created some niche for themselves. We are not looking at the up market. We are looking at the average Ghanaian where anybody can just walk into a, an estate developer and acquire a one-bedroom apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, or even rent at an affordable rate that he or she can afford. So yes, we are looking at a situation where Bank for Housing and Construction will come back to life so that um, our brothers in the building industry will have access to credit. Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Baumia has announced plans by government to launch a further fundraising drive in support of the relief effort in Sierra Leone. More than 400 people are reportedly dead with an estimated 600 more missing in a mud slide that swept away homes on the edge of the capital, Freetown, on Monday, August 14, after some torrential rains. The vice president led a high-powered government delegation that included the interior and defense ministers to present relief items and cash worth $1 million to the government and people of Sierra Leone. Dr. Baumia gave the following details about the Ghanaian relief efforts. We are in it. The president has voted a $1 million from Ghana to Sierra Leone to help the relief effort, which will come in the form of items, both food and non-food items, um, which, and some cash. We've, we've started um, transporting the relief items. Two flights of items have arrived so far, and another two flights <coughs> will arrive tomorrow. He said Ghana will continue to assist Sierra Leone beyond this initial relief effort. Also bringing 45 experts in disaster management to come and help you. Um, and, and, and so far, um, as I said, tomorrow the final two flights of the items will come in, uh, as well as a cash amount of $100,000 will also follow those items to be delivered to you tomorrow. And we have also continued, we are also going to do some <coughs> fundraising in Ghana to support because it is going to be a continuous effort. So beyond this initial vote, we expect that the fundraising that we will do, well, people are going to support this effort and we will make sure we bring in whatever we can raise. Speaking at the event to hand over the Ghanaian relief items, Sierra Leonean President Enes Baikaroma announced that to date, they have managed to bury as many as 431 victims of the disaster. But, um, with uh, the time that has elapsed, uh, the prospects of uh, rescuing uh, our compatriots alive are very, very slim now. Uh, but notwithstanding, we are still uh, pursuing that. Uh, we are still working with the recovery. Uh, those that we succeeded in rescuing are uh, 
uh, hospitalized and uh, receiving treatment. Uh, those that uh, we are not rescued alive, we have uh, been burying and uh, until today we have buried about 481 of uh, our citizens. Um, we are still continuing the search efforts because we believe that uh, we still have more down there. The relief items presented by the vice president included raincoats, mattresses, blankets, bills of used clothing, plastic items such as cups and buckets, powdered milk, sugar, maize, rice, cooking oil, soaps, treated mosquito net, generators and assorted anti-malarial and pain relief medication, as well as boxes of chlorine. And that's it for news. Uh, we have a lot more news. We'll be reviewing the newspapers and then we have the latest of the headlines as published on the various news portals.